After three years of Tennessee fans wanting to run Tim Banks out of town, he's got the number one defense in college football. Was Banks an elite defensive coordinator all along, or has he been blessed this season with the right combo of Jimmys and Joes? Welcome to the Volunteer State. I'm Tennessee beat writer Adam Sparks, along with John Adams of the Knoxville News Sentinel. The Vols are finally going to face a good offense this week at Arkansas. Maybe they're good offense. So what better time to answer this question about Tim Banks? Was he actually really good at his job all along? Also, we'll touch on that Georgia-Alabama thriller and what it could mean for Tennessee moving ahead. John, let's jump right into the Tim Banks topic. And, and I'll tell you, this has been on my mind for the last couple of weeks um, while reading my, my mailbag, uh, you know, where Tennessee fans send in submit questions and their general thoughts on the team and gripes and all this sort of thing. And the one that I've been getting for the past two or three weeks about Tim Banks is quite different than the one that I had gotten the previous three years. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, back up the Brinks truck. You, you got to pay this guy. You got to keep him. You got to do whatever <laughs> it takes. Give him a blank check. Um, and I should look back in the last few years to see if it's the same people that were saying, put a for sale sign in this guy's yard and get him out of town. Because that was a, you know, that was a lot of what we were hearing, especially the first two seasons and still a little bit more, still a little bit last season. Um, so, John, I, I'll ask you, um, I mean, is was Tim Banks a really good defensive coordinator all this time? And, and we just sort of had to wait for the talent to catch up with him? I think it's really – really hard to be a great defensive coordinator when you don't have the the right players on defense. Now, sometimes you have the right players, your defense looks really good, and it turns out in the end you really aren't that good as a defense coordinator. Uh, cue up uh, Jeremy Pruitt, Tennessee's mm -hmm. former coach, who was recognized as a defensive guru when he won a national championship as a defensive coordinator at Florida State had good defenses at Georgia as a defense coordinator, and another national title team at Alabama, defense coordinator there too. We never saw any defensive expertise from Jeremy Pruitt when he was Tennessee's head coach. Just didn't see it. And so as far as Banks goes, he kind of had, had a built-in excuse when he started because everybody wondered, well, how good can your defense be when you're going to run such a high speed up tempo offense? You're, you're not going to get any breaks. It's all about the offense and you got to make do uh, with what you have under difficult, challenging circumstances. And I, he kind of did that in 22, but the thing about it, he had some, there were a few quarterbacks, Anthony Richardson, Bryce Young, uh, Spencer Rattler in that year that, uh, Stetson Bennett in the first half all had tremendous games, career type games against Tennessee's defense. So the safe effort, safe explanation would be to say, well, it was a combination of things in. But with this defense, it seems a personnel seems to fit what he wants to do. And I think that's really important. And he's had guys that have been in the system a while. So I don't think anybody wants to run him out of town anymore. Is he a great defensive coordinator? Uh, maybe we'll know better when he faces some great offenses. We haven't seen one this year. But he's certainly not the defensive liability that some fans made him out to be early on. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll remind everybody we're just we're just four games in now. But the 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 stats are unbelievable. Tennessee's ranked number one in the country in total defense. 176 yards allowed so far per game. Number two in scoring defense, number two in rush defense, number four in pass defense, and you sort of go on down the line. They're arguably the best defense in pretty much every category, uh, at least when you put all those categories together in college football. Have not played Alabama, have not played Georgia, have not played a lot of the teams that that can put up some big numbers, um, but they, they've done as well as they could with, with what's on the schedule. John, you mentioned the the 22 season, of course, that was the year when Tennessee broke all those offensive records and the defense would just sort of like hang on for wins. And <laughs> the floor, the, the Florida game was a good one. Cause that, you know, Anthony Richardson threw for 450 something yards and still it, you know, Tennessee, 
Tennessee st- went up big and still it took the last last uh, play. Kamal hadn't got a pick, I remember, to to seal that win. The 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 quarterback club uh, meeting that next Monday, I have a distinct memory of Tim Banks being the guest speaker. People that don't go to the, the Tennessee quarterback club, you you typically an assistant coach will come and they're scheduled, uh, you know, a few weeks out. And Tim Banks was going to be the assistant coach that would go and talk to the fans at the quarterback club. It was right after that Florida game. And there's a Q&A session where fans can raise their hand and ask a question. And the first question to Tim Banks after that Florida game was, Tim, what's wrong with your defense? (laughs) (laughs) And that's sort of the questions he's been facing the past, at least the first two and a half seasons. And not just from Tennessee fans. I mean, we've we've posed these uh, or had these criticisms of him also. Some of them warranted, I would say, but John, you you talked about sort of what he inherited, which was very little. If you look at the numbers of his four years, as the roster got better, total defense, they were 99th in the country in Tim Banks' first season, 99th, then 92, then 33, and then this year number one in total defense. Same same trend on scoring defense. They were 90th in that first season under Hopple in scoring defense, 90, then 36. Then last year, 22 was a very underrated, good defensive team last year. And then this year, number two in scoring defense. So, I mean, I think the takeaway somewhat is as they've gathered up more depth, accumulated more depth and got better players and recruited better, the better the players, the better the better, better Tim Banks looks. I, I think it's maybe as simple as that. Yeah, and it starts up front. Um, that's been pretty well circulated through the years that and Tennessee has a defensive front unlike any I've seen this season we're accustomed to seeing Alabama and Georgia with these kind of defensive fronts they can stonewall a running game uh, bring immense pressure on a quarterback when he's back to pass Tennessee hasn't had one like this not this dominant and what's so interesting about it is uh, the rotation you wrote a really good story on this a while back about the the just paltry number of snaps that the first teamers are playing. Everybody's fresh. And to me, so many games are decided in the fourth quarter because your defensive front, if it's been pass rushing all game long, or if it's been trying to cover those bubble screens to the outside, running horizontally all the time, you get worn down and it's hardest to sustain a rush. But that's not a problem for Tennessee. So it's one thing to have that, to have that ability, to have that kind of depth. But then you've got to be willing to implement it. You got to have the courage to do it. You got to have the courage to say, well, these are my four best guys, but there's not that difference between this four and the next four or the four after that. And so I give I give Tim Banks. It's not just on him. It's the whole defensive staff. Rodney Garner is certainly an elite defensive line coach. Nobody would question that. But so they deserve credit for the way they're using that. The thing is, everybody has depth, but are you willing to use it? And some people aren't. They don't trust the backups. Tim Banks has trusted the backups on defense in the defensive front, and they're delivering. So when you have that kind of front, it just changes things. Uh, now your linebacking core, and I had questions about the linebacking core going into the season, uh, but the linebackers look really good. They seem to be covering more ground in part because they don't have to worry so much about blockers. The blockers are getting walled off by that defensive front. And then the secondary, everybody wonders, well, is Stevens secondary, will it be any better? And it has been. Uh, quarterbacks don't have a lot of time to pick apart a secondary but the secondary is also made play. So you put it all together and it's how you make those pieces fit and how you, how you line up your defense to play to its strengths and cover the weaknesses. And I think Tennessee has done really well at that. I can't really see any defenses right now, but maybe against a better offense, we will. Yeah. The, the depth on the defensive line. I mean, there's obvious advantages to that. There's even a psychological edge uh, to that. I think we've talked about this before about how, if you're an offensive lineman, you see just a new guy every three or four plays and that guy's fresh. 
I'm not sure if, if this showed up. I was in Norman, Oklahoma for the Oklahoma game, obviously. And I don't know if this showed up on the TV broadcast or not. But if you remember back to when Tennessee got the safety, as Jason Jenkins and a couple other guys got the safety, I think it was a play or two before that. There was a false start by Oklahoma. And you, you saw Tennessee's defensive line jumping up and down and, and sort of <laughs> mocking Oklahoma's <laughs> offensive line. Yeah. And it was just sort of these – there was this contrast of a worn-out offensive line and these jovial guys on the other side that knew they were going to play like six snaps in the whole game, and this was like number two of their six snaps. And I just feel like there's there's got to be some kind of psychological um, edge to that. I think for Tim Banks particularly, you know, if, if, if people don't know, and sometimes it's hard to see when Tennessee is so offensively driven, but – Tim Banks matches Josh Heupel in that he's very aggressive. Tim Banks loves to blitz. He did that when he was at Penn State. He did that when he was at Cincinnati. Um, he loves to blitz. And if your defensive line is, let's say, just average, which Tennessee's was the first couple couple years uh, of his tenure, if your defensive line is just average, when you blitz a safety or blitz a couple of linebackers, you're – you know, you're you're sort of trying to inflict pain, inflict a wound that is not there already. You know what I mean? Like uh, your defensive line is blocked. You're rolling the dice and saying my guy is going to blitz and he's going to get there before that quarterback can release the ball. With the way that they're blitzing now, it's I think it's quite different. It's so if you take my uh, my inflict a wound analogy here. It's it, with, with what they have now, it's sort of like the knife is already in there of what the defensive line has done. And the blitz is just sort of just sort of turning the knife uh, because they're beating one on one blocks. They're taking on double teams. And so when you already have that advantage up front and that quarterback is already feeling that pressure from the front four, when you're blitzing somebody, it's just sort of a, a sort of an overwhelming factor. It's it's sort of leaning into a place where you're already winning. And I think Tim Bakes just relishes that. He knows that his defensive line can get there anyway. So I'm just sort of going to double down and send another guy up there. And so it, it works into his mentality. Um, you, you know, so I, I just think, and if you look at the pieces they've added, uh, you mentioned linebackers, Keenan Peely, the guy at the portal. We had to wait a full year to see him. They've got they've got the defensive backs now. Jalen McMurray, Jermard McCoy is maybe if he's not the best corner so far in the SEC, he's top three or four. They've got Jackson Moy from Stanford, who is like their eleventh defensive lineman, but he's he's played great when he's gone in there. And then they've recruited James Pierce and Joshua Josephs and, and these type of guys. And so you've seen the roster on the defensive side fill out, and it's now matching more more of what Tim Banks wants to do. Yeah, when Tennessee got Jackson uh more, I, I didn't I didn't think that was a, such a great je- a get. I mean, I didn't I didn't really know that much about him. He wasn't like you just signed a future All-American. But boy, watching him against Oklahoma, the first thing I had to do was check the number because I didn't have his number memorized. And that speaks again to the depth. And he was making plays. That's what gets me about this defensive front. It seems like they all weigh 300 pounds and they're all really quick for their size. And you're right. It has a wearing effect. I'm glad you brought that up about blitzing because the the general theory is, and it's a good one, if you have a, a powerful front four and you don't need much help to sustain a pass rush, that's such an advantage. You can keep your your safeties don't have to worry about stuff as much. You no, know, it, it's, it's really a nice thing to lean on. However, if you're already winning the battle up front and then you bring in other guys as well, the way you described it, it does have an, to me, an overwhelming effect. It's just, Oh my God, we can't block this front four. And now they're sitting, they got a corner blitz coming, a delayed blitz by the safety. We don't know where they're coming from. So it's as though Tim Bikes is playing with house money. Yeah, my front four is really good. But wait till you get, wait till you get a load of the whole blitz package we're bringing. You think it's rough now? It's only going to get worse. And I think it does have a demoralizing effect on 
on offenses and on offensive coordinators. So what's interesting about Tim Banks' situation is this is sort of a contract year for him. You know, we always use that term with NFL <laughs> players. We, we do that some, some with NIL guys going into the portal that you have that one year where you're sort of trying to cash in on your value. Um, and that's, that's, that that's this year for him, his contract, he got an extension. I think it was a couple of years ago. His contract will run up in January. Um, he made he made one point three million dollars a year his first season when he got to Tennessee. Went up to one point four, and the last two seasons he's made one point five million dollars plus you know plus the bonuses they get if they go to a bowl or whatever. But one point five million dollars for the listeners out there. I don't know if that sounds like a lot or a little. Um, it's it's pretty good for assistants. The top assistant coaches in college football make between one, three and 2 million. I think the highest is like 2.1, 2.2, something like that. So he's sort of in like that top 20 uh, paid uh, assistant coaches, especially coordinators. So John, the question is when it comes to January or probably before that, Tim Banks will be due for an extension, probably two years. Usually Josh Hopple signs his coordinators for two years, not one for obvious reasons. Um, does he deserve an extension already? Can we say that? And does he deserve a, a raise? Will he get more than $1.5 million? Well, if this season unfolds the way it has so far, it, if in the end of November, we're still having this conversation about Tennessee having the number one defense in the country. Yes, he'll get a raise. And he would be very valuable on, on an open market. His value skyrockets when you have this kind of season. Uh, I still, as good as I think this defense is, I still want to see it against a well-rounded, dynamic offense. We haven't seen anything close to that. Um, four, D, four, well, the three FBS teams Tennessee's played, it also played SCS opponent Chattanooga. The three FBS teams, none of those rank lower than, rank, rank better than 100th nationally in total in total offense. Now, part of that had to do because they faced Tennessee's defense, but that, so there's no, none of these offenses are proficient as good as Oklahoma is ordinarily on offense. This offense is nothing like that. Uh, North Carolina state beat Northern Illinois last Saturday with 171 yards total offense. I didn't Ugh. think that was, I didn't think that was possible <laughs> in Kent state is at the very bottom nationally in total offense. And that's the best bet of the year. It will stay there. It's already lost two quarterbacks. Tennessee played all those teams. That, to me, is what's interesting about the Arkansas game because I look at Arkansas, and I was looking up numbers, stats, uh, after the game Saturday, and Arkansas is 13th in the country in total offense. Well, I've watched Arkansas in three games. I never thought I was watching a, a top 10, top 15 offense, but those were the numbers. I'm still not sure how much Arkansas can test this defense. It's on paper. It is certainly better than anything Tennessee's face. But I'm starting to wonder if we will have to get to the Alabama game before we can coronate Tennessee's defense as the best out there. We might just have yeah, to yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's a good point because it's they haven't they haven't played a good offense yet. I thought maybe Grayson McCall, NC State, would be a, a passer that they could check off of. Hey, we faced this really good, but the the offense was not good. The passing and, offense was not good, and he lost uh, his starting job after that game. Yeah, yeah. So it's just so th there's the possibility this defense is fool's gold. It really could be. <laughs> uh, but I, I think you're right. We're not going to know. Maybe we find out some in the Arkansas game. I mean, Florida is not going to have – maybe DJ Lagway can run it around quite a bit. I just I just don't feel like Florida is going to have the, the firepower. Um, even after the Alabama game, Kentucky doesn't have it. Mississippi State doesn't have it. UTEP doesn't have it. Vanderbilt <laughs> doesn't really have it. I mean, they got a quarterback that can run around, but there's a couple of those guys on the schedule, one of them this week. It's, it's really, I think, Alabama-Georgia. If they – if they play reasonably well on defense against Alabama and Georgia, this ranking is probably gonna gonna hold most of the the season. 
John, you probably let, let's jump onto the Arkansas game. You probably watched more Arkansas this year than I have. I watched the entire um, Oklahoma State game a few weeks ago. I saw some of their game last week. Um, Bobby Petrino can he can call offense. There's no doubt about that. Um, he can take a subpar group of players and turn them into a, at least a pretty productive offense. Taylor Green is his quarterback. He's a Boise State transfer. Uh, Jaquindon Jackson, he's their big running back, big physical running back. I think they got him from Utah. So they have some transfers. Um, is John, is it as simple as keep Green, that quarterback, in the pocket and, and you win that side of the ball? Has it just come down to that? I think that's a big factor. Uh, you're certainly right about Petrino. I always have thought he's a good play caller. One of the things I like Petr about Petrino in his various football coaching stops, he won with different kinds of quarterbacks. I remember when things were going well at different places, and he, he could go with a drop-back guy. He could go with a, a running guy, a dual-threat guy who could even run the option. So I like that about Petrino. This is kind of an interesting offense when I watch it. Uh, I don't know if you remember years ago, Arkansas had a quarterback named Matt Jones. Sure, yeah. He was he was 6'5", uh, sprinter. Uh, wasn't a great passer, but he threw pretty, threw pretty well on the run. And they had some really good running backs. They could run the ball down your throat. I thought they should have been running an, uh, an option offense. Uh, he was so good at that. It was very hard to tackle him in the open field because – DBs invariably misjudged his his speed, consequently took the wrong angles because of those long strides. Taylor Green's strides might be even longer, and he's also very fast. He looks like a sprinter when he gets going, and so I think it's really important with Tennessee secondary, if he does get outside containment, you get the right angle because you can – there was a play last week I saw – I thought for sure they uh, uh, a defensive player had him had the angle and was going to make the play, force him out of bounds. No, he turned the corner, and he has that kind of speed that that he could turn. It won't just be an eight or nine yard run; he could take it to the end zone. So I think with him, he's also he seems better on the deep throws than he does on the intermediate. He, he doesn't strike me as the kind of quarterback that will just drop. He's only he's only complete like 50%, 53% of his passes. He's not some guy you just think will just drop back there, dink and dunk, hit short passes, intermediates, lead you downfield. But he does have big play potential, and that's, to me, key. You're looking for a, a key point, I think. Don't give up the big plays. But you also got to – the Jaquindon Jackson – I've seen him break a lot of tackles. Um, I'm not sure Arkansas shouldn't have used him even more. I, I think he can really break tackles. He's a good running back. Watched him at Utah. Uh, he's not gonna. He's not Dylan Sampson. He's not going to outrun a secondary, but he's he can some punish some guys up front. And I, another thing about Arkansas's offense, the offensive line was an extreme weakness last year. And it's much better this year. And it transfers again. They can reshape an offensive line. Uh, Austin Nichols, a former Tennessee lineman who wasn't really playing at Tennessee, is starting for Arkansas. So apparently he's doing pretty well. Josh Braun, who was an offensive lineman at Florida with considered to have great potential, he's I guess he's playing pretty well too because they are moving the ball on the ground. Yeah, with with Taylor Green, it's I think the game within the game there is you you have to keep him contained in the pocket. Um, you know, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I saw him the other day during the broadcast. Like when he gets out of the pocket, he's like a B plus passer. Yeah, if he's if he's in the quarterback, he's in the pocket. He's like a D minus passer. <laughs> like if you can just keep him in the pocket, he's awful. He gets on the outside. He looks like a Bobby Petrino type type quarterback, and that's where you get a lot of the big plays when he's on the run. So it's it's going to be interesting to see how Tennessee uses that pass rush because 
you know, James Pierce, uh, I, I wrote about this this week where I broke down all his different plays and uh, how he has played better than the numbers show because of ways he has influenced opposing offenses, how he's he's one of the leaders in the conference and quarterback hurries, although the sacks have not come. He, he sort of can't be overly aggressive this week. This may be another week where he – where he impacts the game but does not get sacks because if he is rushing real far upfield, it's going to leave a lane for Taylor Green to run in. Same way with Joshua Josephs or Tyree West or uh, Dominic Bailey on the other side. Um, you almost have to contain on the outside and then use that that middle of your defensive line, the Omar Norman Lotz and Omari Thomas and Bryson Eason, those guys to push the middle. Um, and to make him stay in the pocket. And, and really, I mean, Addison Nichols, that the, the center that you mentioned that was at Tennessee before, I mean, he's going to be sort of a key to all this because if you can push him into the backfield, all 350 pounds of Elijah Simmons, if he can push him <laughs> into the backfield of Taylor Green, um, that's going to that's gonna make a huge difference in that offense because it, it's just Arkansas's offense has not functioned throwing the ball if Green – is in that pocket. And I feel like if they don't have the big play potential, this could be a game where Tennessee gets up 14 nothing or something in the first quarter and sort of can run away with it. That's the game that I think Tennessee fans have been waiting to see, the get up early and then punch the gas. You didn't have that in the Oklahoma game. I found it interesting that Sam Pittman said on his Monday presser that he found a lot of quote-unquote interesting things in – uh in Venable's uh, defensive scheme that he used against Tennessee, maybe some elements of that that defense are going to be mimicked by Arkansas if they can do that. Uh, just trying to make Tennessee run the ball um, and to try to disguise things pre-snap so it so it um, you know fools Nico a little bit, and then maybe Josh Hoppel gets a little conservative and doesn't want to expose his quarterback. We'll see if those offensive tackles are back for Tennessee this week. Uh, expect Josh Apple to uh, to punch the gas a lot more than he than he did at Oklahoma. I really think, uh, Adam, this is a game where Tennessee's offense that Hypo will crank up the offense. Uh, this isn't an Oklahoma defense. For all of Oklahoma's troubles on offense, there's nothing wrong with the Sooners' defense. It's got they've got some really good players, and that showed. And Brent Venables is considered a an excellent uh, defensive strategist uh, and they played well against Tennessee and they took some things away. Uh, running yards were really tough. I don't know that Arkansas has that kind of capability. I don't think it has that kind of personnel. Uh, UAB passed for like 235, three touchdowns against Arkansas, kept the game close. Um, then Oklahoma State, Alex Bowman threw for over 320 yards on Arkansas. So to me, this is a game where where Heupel comes out there thinking we're going to let it rip a little bit against this team. We'll see, but I think that's possible. John, let me switch gears real quick. Uh, I want to go to the the Georgia Alabama game, but let me let me also go back in time a little bit to the the Oklahoma game two weeks ago, and then this past week. I, it was an off week, so I got to I got to sit at home all day and just watch games. <laughs> it, it make me wonder why I'm in this industry and why not I just have a nine to five and get to watch football all day Saturday uh, on the TV instead of instead of live. But it, it was a good off week. I got to see Oklahoma uh, play in that big win at Auburn. It, it looks like they found their quarterback, at least a good enough quarterback in Hawkins, the guy that only played at the end of the Tennessee game. John, if if they had played with that quarterback instead of Jackson Arnold. Is that game much different against Tennessee? I don't really think it would have been, Adam. I know he did some things. He did some things effectively. He was more effective than Jackson Arnold was, but Tennessee was playing with a nice cushion then, and it was kind of playing the clock, I thought. Uh, And I watched him against Auburn. He had a long touchdown run to start the game, but over the – over the breadth of the game, he wasn't, to me, that effective. The The reason he is more valuable in my mind and the reason he's he's the quarterback right now instead of Jackson Arnold, I know it's popular to uh, criticize Jackson Arnold at this point. He had trouble with turnovers in his first four starts. But you look at 
Uh, Jackson Arnold's a good passer. He's also mobile. But Oklahoma doesn't have any receivers. I mean, when you're down five receivers, clearly you're top three receivers. And you can make a case top five, but definitely top three. How many teams would be that adept at throwing the ball? And certainly if you're Jackson Arnold and you're already playing a behind a uh, uh, an ineffectual offensive line and now you got no receivers, you're better off just handing a ball to Michael Hawkins and say, well, just go make a play. Uh, good luck with that. You're, he's very athletic. He'll put his – you probably saw that play where he dove into the end zone. Just yeah, It was reminiscent of John Elway in a Super Bowl many years ago. But he just threw himself up there and – sort of helicoptered into the in the end zone. Uh, I would be – I really think if if Oklahoma gets its receivers back and that offensive line gets better, it might be better with Arnold. A quarterback, maybe not. But I, I think also it could beat some teams that we don't see it beating right now. Tennessee played Oklahoma at the perfect time. So I think if Oklahoma won some games it wasn't supposed to win, that win for Tennessee would look even better later on. Yeah, it looked a little better for Tennessee, the fact that they did win that game. Yes. Um, it, it's, it, and we'll see, Oklahoma has a brutal, brutal schedule coming. But they could huh. maybe maybe compete. Yeah, I, I thought the around that quarterback, Hawkins, I thought the vibes were better than his production. Like the like you said, sacrificing yeah. his body and yes, had a couple of highlights. But like if you look at it, it wasn't. I think if he had started the Oklahoma game, Tennessee's Tennessee's approach would have been a little different mm-hmm. um, because it caught him off guard as backup mobile backup quarterbacks usually do late in games like that. I think the score probably would have been around the same, or at least the the margin. So so let's look at the the Georgia Alabama game, and I wrote about this after the game Saturday night. Like, if you watch the first half of that game, if you're a Tennessee fan, you watch the first half of that game, you probably said, oh, no, the tide coming to Neyland, that's going to be tough. And also you looked at it and said, you know, maybe Georgia is beatable in Athens this year. If you watch, like, the fourth quarter or part, at least a portion of the second half, you you may have said the opposite. Hey, Alabama, you, you can beat them again like you did two years ago in Neyland. Uh, or George is going to be a tough out in Athens. It really depended on how late you went to bed, and I watched the whole thing, <laughs> and I was a little mixed up by the end of it. But I did see more vulnerabilities in Georgia than I did Alabama. Uh, how, did, how did John? How did you your perspective change on those two games, Tennessee versus Alabama, Tennessee versus Georgia, based on what you saw in that thriller the other night? Well, it it reconfirmed what I already thought. Uh, watching Georgia in all its games this season, watching Alabama, um, I think Alabama, and even though it's in Neyland, I think that will be a tougher game for Tennessee. That I think Tennessee's going to beat Georgia. And I really, just, yeah, I just, I don't think this is an aberration. What I think Georgia has some problems on offense. And I'm not sure it can correct them. For one thing now, I've watched two defensive fronts pretty much shut down uh, Georgia's running game. And I know Trevor Etienne's a good running back, but they're they're not blocking people in the run. They're doing better in pass protection, but not in the run. You couldn't it couldn't move Kentucky. It couldn't move um, it couldn't move Alabama. I don't think it'll move Tennessee. And then so you, then you're going to have to lean on Carson Beck, who is a very accurate passer. And I, he's had a shoulder problem this year. I don't know if it affected him in that game. He underthrew some balls. I don't know if that's a fair assessment. But I still like him as a passer. I still think he's a first-round draft pick. But he needs more help than, say, Jalen Milrow does. Jalen Milrow just creates so much on his own. He's a nightmare for defenses because his combination of of speed and his improvisational ability, he can go off script and do very well. I think think Carson Beck looked unsure of himself uh, early on, which is a strange thing to say. A guy that 
looked very in control last year, especially in Neyland. He looked very in control in third downs, a very accurate passer. I think we're seeing the results of losing a Brock Bowers. I think we're seeing the results of a guy that has been in the system for so long and having that safety net of Bowers and knowing that's there. And then suddenly you're adding a few pieces. They had a couple transfers. Trevor Etienne is there. And it's just, there's new pieces. And it's it's rare now to have a veteran quarterback that's been in a system for so long. And it's when you shake up things a little bit, it can, you know, it can sort of ruin the stability. And I think Carson Beck has been a guy that has really taken advantage of the stability. Um, so I say all that to say what we saw the other night it may be very different by the time Tennessee gets to Athens and he may have found his safety net um, in, in a tight end or a wide receiver running back or, or whatever. Um, I, you know, I wonder defensively, I, I saw some athletes with Alabama, maybe that I didn't see as much out of Georgia on the defensive side. You know, in those games the past few years, you think about the one two years ago, Alabama did not have the secondary to match up with Tennessee. And and Josh Hopple sort of carved up that secondary when Hinton Hooker threw for 400 and something yards or whatever and won that game. Um, but then in the Georgia game that same year, I know we're comparing two years apart, but but this team has some similarities to that one. That That same year, really the last two years, Tennessee matched up with Georgia poorly in that Tennessee wants to spread people out on offense to sort of expose holes uh, in space. And when you do that against Georgia, Georgia had elite athletes uh, on every part of the field on its defense. And so you're, you're sort of getting matchups that Georgia's going to win one-on-ones in. Like you're not, you're hurting yourself almost to spread them out sometimes because your corner, Georgia's corners out in space are going to win man-to-man coverage. You're when you're isolating Georgia's defensive line, typically you're going to also lose those one on ones. So spacing Georgia out doesn't make any difference. Um, it may make a little more difference this year because I, I see elite players on Georgia's side of the ball, but I don't see as many of them. And, and I do have some questions in their secondary after seeing what Jalen Milrow did getting out of the pocket and throwing on the run. I think Nico. Has has some of those qualities at least that could be developed, and uh, so I, I wonder too if if Georgia is more beatable. I, I just wonder. My question with you is how much does the fact that Georgia, the Georgia game is in Athens and the Alabama game is in Neyland, does that not twist you a little bit more towards thinking Alabama is more beatable? Yes, it does, and that was what I thought going into the season. I thought Alabama was a game Tennessee could win. I thought it would be hard to win harder to win at Sanford stadium. But that was also with the image I had of, uh, had of Georgia, which has been a few years in the making under Kirby smart back to back national titles. Tennessee hasn't come close to Georgia. There was that 27, 13 game, but that was because Georgia shut down its offense in the rain. So it really hasn't come close to Georgia, but I look at this Georgia team differently. And it's funny how, I mean, it was a great game because of the comeback, because of how good Alabama was initially and then the comeback. But I don't, I didn't look at either one of those teams and say, at any point when Alabama was going up 28 nothing, and when Georgia was making that fourth quarter drive to glory, I didn't look at either one of them and say, boy, who's nobody's going to touch these teams. They'll have a rematch for the national title. I never thought that. And Alabama's secondary play in that second half, some of those Georgia guys were just open by leaps and bounds. They were just so wide open. It reminded me of the game you referenced between Tennessee and Alabama two years ago when nobody covered Jalen Hyatt. And that Alabama had defense had three future NFL guys in the secondary. So a lot of it might be scheme, but see, I look at – I wonder about that Alabama secondary. If you can't cover better than that, I think Tennessee has better receivers. So I guess my main takeaway from that game was uh, Tennessee might be better than both these teams. Yeah, and I, and I think maybe my takeaway from that is that maybe there's a lot of parity 
in the top 15 teams of college football this year, which is, you know, part of that is NIL and the transfer portal, probably more so the transfer portal because you can go out and shift your roster around year to year. Um, but it's also perfect timing because we've got a 12 team playoff this year. And my biggest fear was that we have a 12 team playoff and there's only like two elite teams and we just have to sit and wait till they play. I don't think that's the case this year. I, I, I think you probably have eight teams that could win the national championship, at least judging it from like a month and a half into the season right now in Tennessee of what we've seen so far could be one of those teams. So could Georgia and Alabama and, and those, uh, those games will obviously carry a lot of weight, but Tennessee has, a while to go before then Tennessee goes on the road, as we mentioned before at Arkansas this week, that's another road game in the sec. And then they're home for really five weeks, four home games, plus another bye week, another off week. Um, so, but they, they've got to beat Arkansas to get to Alabama and then to get to get to Georgia. I will be in, in Fayetteville to cover that game. Uh, John will have commentary, obviously uh, from the game. Mike Wilson uh, will also uh, help us out with some coverage there. And you can follow all that coverage on knoxnews.com. Uh, subscribe to the pod, listen to the pod every week. And uh, thanks for listening to this edition of the Volunteer State.